welcome everybody to this month's uh, live digital fundraising show. We're excited to have you all back. Uh, each month we get more and more uh, people tuning in and we're excited about uh, this month. Now uh, we have a few more people on our show uh, this month, so bear with us if we have uh, any technical issues, we will attempt to solve them if we run into them. So. Um, it's been a, another great month here at uh, BWF. We've had a number of exciting uh, phone calls and conversations. I just got back uh, yesterday from the Case Social Media Conference. Uh, fellow digital fundraisers from all over the country and even uh, a few from Canada uh, were there. And it was, a, it was a great conference, lots of great discussions around uh, some really exciting topics, new developments in fundraising. Uh, I think the session that I enjoyed the most was from uh, University of Nebraska talking about uh, paid social and uh, all the things that are going on in that space. And uh, so it was a it was a great conference. Uh, but on to today's show, we're excited to have uh, with us um, uh, Thomas Koch and uh, Duncan Knox from uh, from Hub. Uh, they are going to be talking to us today about uh, social ambassadors. So without any further ado, we're going to turn the time over to them. If you have questions during the show today, if you'll just uh, ask your questions in the comments section here below the video, uh, we'll be monitoring those questions and we'll ask, uh, we'll ask them as we get them. Uh, so again, uh, make sure you ask your questions in the comments section and we'll, without any further ado, we'll turn it over to Duncan. Duncan, welcome. Excited to have you. Hi, Barrett. Thanks for having me too. Um, let me just, I've just started sharing my screen. Are you getting it okay? Yes. Yep. We can, we can see it just fine. Super. Well, hello everyone. I'm going full screen here. Great. So let me just start by asking, um, how many of you, have been in a room in a meeting um, where someone has said, we need to be more digital. And, you know, probably everyone agrees. Um, but then I also want to know how many of you weren't absolutely sure what that meant? Come on now, hands up. Yeah, I see you in the back. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard question to answer, but that's what I'm going to try and do today. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about what digital fundraising really is, why it's successful, and also how you can make it su successful with your campaigns. And then I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Tom, um, who's gonna show you um, some of the technology and some, and some deeper insights in, into, into how that works. So let's get started. So, going forward, great. So my name's Duncan Knox. I'm the founder of Hubbub. Um, we are, uh, so we are the UK's largest provider of digital fundraising technology to, to the HE sector. Um, think crowdfunding, giving days, social profiling, ambassador programs, etc. cetera. Um, but I am in fact, by trade, a failed physics teacher. That's how I got started. Um, this is the school where I taught, Tunbridge in England. And, you know, I'm not doing it to boast. This is only about a three out of 10 in the UK in terms of buildings. Um, so nothing too special, but you're not here to hear about me. So why are we here? And I think I figured that out and I investigated them for a time um, up close and personal. And it's these guys, these guys who are making us change what we do. So it, they get a bad rap. And in fact, someone once said, if the whole world depends on today's youth, I can't see the world lasting another hundred years. So that's the first quiz question. Do you know who that is? It's a tough one. Yeah, yeah, Michigan State, you got it right. Yeah, hundred years, uh, it, it was Socrates. So he said that two and a half thousand years ago, which means that we've been getting progressively worse generation by generation for that long. And, uh, and look at us now. Um, but Maybe, maybe he had something uh, right in that sentence because uh, this is what my students look like generally throughout my lessons um, and maybe it will look the same in about 10 minutes time. We'll see. 
So this is, though, the digital generation. Have you ever seen those kids who try to scale a newspaper or magazine page using their fingers because they're so used to it from this age because they're looking at screens like this. So to, to try and start to answer what is digital fundraising, I want to talk about first some of our traditional campaigns. So another question, what's the very best form of fundraising? What's the best channel that we use? I imagine some of you are thinking face-to-face. -face. It's a common, a common answer I hear, and I agree. So this is one thing that charities in the UK do to try and do face-to-face -face fundraising, but to the masses, because we can't meet all of our alumni. Do you have these guys uh, in the US? Um, where a charity, Anorak, and they kind of stop you in the street and ask you for money? Um, it's quite a big thing in the UK. Uh, we have a name for them. Uh, they're called chuggers. This is uh, the word charity and mugger stuck together to make chuggers. Um, it's not an endearing term. Um, and the problem is it, it's, they still do it. It's not enormously successful. Um, but the reason is it's it's face to face, but it's not particularly personal because we're not really segmenting. We're stopping the people who look you in the eye and then we grab them for a handshake, or at least these guys do. So there's kind of poor segmentation and it's not as personal as the face-to-face -face that your, say, major gifts team do. So let's try another one. Let's try direct mail, okay? So, you know, this is pretty true. I do like getting a letter now, but what type of response rates do you get from your direct mail campaigns. Um, generally, I hear if we beat 1%, that's fantastic, um, which, which might be a little bit alarming. So, um, I mean, what would work? How do we try and get that up? Well, we segment, don't we? We use people's first names. Generally, we're just trying to make things a bit more personal. Um, my favorite method, and I recommend you try it, is use pink envelopes, a little bit of uh, fragrance, and, and maybe some lipstick. That, that, that improves things no end, um, but we can't do that for everyone. So this is what that campaign looks like. We've got the university in the middle and we're reaching people in one-to-one -one relationships. It's, it's not incredibly personal. Um, and maybe the segmentation we're doing isn't that personal either. Are we sending different letters based on you know, personal interests or are, are we basing them whether they're a live hunt or a side hunt? Um, which is a non-personal form of segmentation, I'd, I'd argue. So this is a, a traditional campaign, centralized. Let's look at telephones. Now, I, just, I see Stanford, stay in the room. Thank you. Right, so this, I, you know, actually telephones work a lot of the time. We know it does. Um, I just enjoyed this cartoon. But when we look at a telephone campaign, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reach people in a more personal way. You'll hear me say this a few times. Um, here's an example of what they did at Australian National University. So some of you might try this as well. The moment a gift was given by phone, the uh, student caller got in front of the camera, sent a personal message straight to the person with their name. It was very great. So, but my question to you is, who would be the perfect telephone caller, telephone ambassador? I know we use students for good reason, but is there anyone else that could do a better job? What about a donor? Let's say I gave to my institution and they then persuaded me to go and tell my friends, my best friends that know all sorts of stuff about me and I know about them, and said, this is why I gave, I think you should give too. Because of that personal relationship, I can be really direct and put pressure on in a friendly way. Um, and it's something that I've maybe seen once, um, but, but not widely at all. Um, and this is what that campaign looks like. So traditional direct mail, centralized. Now, when we use student callers, what we do, you can see the nodes in the diagram these are our callers, they're ambassadors, they're people who are trying to reach people 
in a close-up. The lines are shorter, as you can see in the diagrams. That's, that's intentional. It's because it's a slightly closer personal relationship. So that's what we're trying to do. We're decentralizing that campaign. Now, why does it work, work a, bit, a bit better? Why do we do that? Because nobody wants to be treated as an impersonal person. Um, they want to know about something. They want to be treated as an individual because that isn't, in fact, anyone. I mean, we're actually like this. And we're wonderful and beautiful and colorful and we all have their own interests. Now, what would you do with these people? If you've got a pirate, Who's going to get make the ask? You get another pirate to ask them because they can communicate with them. The guy who's flipping you the bird, go at the top. Maybe don't ask them at all because you found something out about them and what they th what they think. Um, maybe they didn't get very good grades. Who knows? So how can we? What we need to do is try and have as many personal relationships, discussions, asks for money as we can. And how can we do it for our entire alumni base? It's tough. We can't meet everyone. We can, well, maybe we, maybe we can't phone everyone, but how can we do it personally? And this is where social media enters. So this is an example of um, a fundraising ask shared by an alumnus, um, a class giving rep at Babson College in Massachusetts. Now, what they do is they have loads of giving days every year. They've been doing it for a few years now, and each one is for its own class year. So they do lots of small ones, um, but they can focus on that year for that, say, fortnight or for that day in that fortnight. Um, so this guy, Boris, says, I've donated. And then he starts to tell his friends about his family, about an update, about how, he, how his baby girl, Ava, is doing. And his friends, of course, reply, and they do the same. And they've built this bit of a giving tradition. Um, and this is what happens with social media. I mean, you probably you might be able to ask your donors to go and tell their friends. Some would do it. Some would feel awkward. Um, and you're maybe not sure what they're going to say. But with with social media, we are a lot happier sharing things and being friendly. Um, so why is that true? Well, let me ask you a question. So oh. Before I ask that question, so this is what happened with Babson when they did it like this. They basically, over the last four years, doubled their participation. It's, it's really quite fantastic. Um, I'd love to see how, how it's going this year as well. Um, if you'd like to see the full presentation, there's a, there's a slide deck uh, at the Hubbub Sharing Center, um, if, that would, if that's of interest. Um, I've got a link at the end of the presentation. So my question to you. The last time you asked out someone on a date, did you text them or phone them? If you're anything like me, and I know, or, or most people now, we probably text because it's a bit easier. Do you know what? You can plan your jokes. That helps. You can write the perfect message, and, and it's less scary. You're not going to get rejected. It takes the pressure off. So that's it's just one reason why social media is filling this gap of reaching people. Right, so that's what I think digital fundraising is. Maybe the best word is social fundraising. It's simply about reaching more people, but in a personal way. And that's the power, that's how our, our world has changed. So maybe we call it social fundraising from now on. Right. We've got to reach people though. And the way to understand how to reach people is to understand their behaviors. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about alumni, sometimes I think of bacteria. Um, yeah, I see you nodding. Yeah, so what does that mean though? So to, to show you what I mean by this, I'm gonna show a little video here. Um, it's a Ryan Gosling kind of viral video, went really viral. Um, you might hear a small sound, but, but not too much. You're not missing it if you don't hear it words. Uh, he took my wife and slept with her. Ah. Thank you. 
or a motorcycle, not a U-Haul truck. And he said, uh, that's strange because... Right. So that was a huge viral campaign, reached millions, and it was just funny. In fact, there was a set of different videos. Um, sad story, in fact, the creator actually um, died from cancer about a year ago. And uh, if you search, you can find, in fact, Ryan Gosling in memory to him eating his cereal, uh, which was a really classy touch, I think. But this is what the, one of the campaigns looked like within it. I call it a campaign because uh, we understand that word. So viral growth, this 1.1 share messages is shared by 1.1 people is shared by one is just it's a myth that form of viral growth is a myth what in fact what happens is just like the bacteria we have high influencers who share messages and content and reach people and the bigger the influencer the further the message reaches through the twitter sphere as you can see so here's a big influencer on the left and it's spread a bit further now the question is are there things that we can do to prepare our campaigns to do this? So that's what I'm going to talk about in the second half. I'm going to talk about how we can have strategies to do this automatically to help our campaigns go further. But I think this is probably a really good time to break and, and see if you have any questions at the time. So uh, Barrett, let me pass back to you just now. Sure, thank you. Um, now, those of you who are hearing that we're now in Q&A session, uh, there is a slight delay from when you hear that we're ready for questions and, and when you actually hear, uh, hear that. So um, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the comments section uh, below. Uh, otherwise, I, I do have one for you, Duncan. Um, so, You've been talking about these uh, different channels and their level of success and sharing some really interesting uh, figures. And I think um, all that makes a lot of sense. Um, can you maybe address uh, messaging for a moment? Um, what kind of messaging have you seen that helps uh, a campaign to spread? Sure. Well, so Ryan Gosling is the example I used um, because it was, it's fun and interesting and if you share it you get credibility or, or kudos from from your own friends and crowd because they wanted to see it and they're glad you shared it now it's obviously a bit harder with fundraising campaigns um but i there are some very funny ones um university of south carolina had one a, a few years ago where they had their mascot dressed up walking around the campus it was very funny i liked it um, Do any of you read The Oatmeal? So it's kind of an online cartoon by Matthew Inman. And what he says is that to create social media or messages that spread, you need to create things that people desperately want to click. And he says people should want to click them so hard that Facebook servers eventually poop their pants. I quote. Um, because that's what makes us do it. Things generally have to be interesting, funny, or or sometimes, you know, pull the heartstrings, so a really great cause. And sometimes, you know, we can actually blend those things together. So you can make a great cause with great impact, have a funny uh, edge to it too. Um, and generally, if you cover those three things, people are gonna share them, and that's gonna, what's gonna make campaigns spread like we saw. Awesome. Thank you for that. Why don't we why don't we keep rolling and I will let you know if we get some questions coming in, okay? Yeah, super. Okay. Right. So we talked before about the centralized and the decentralized campaigns. So we're we're looking at how we can use ambassadors uh, on the right to to share our messages for us. So here's another way of looking at it. We're just breaking up that big long green arrow going straight to donor, putting people in the middle. So who do we want for these ambassadors? So here we go, we've got Jim, 100,000 followers. Uh, he thinks he's a comedian uh, and he plays the guitar pretty well. We've got Jill, 500 Twitter followers. She likes hockey and economics. Um, 
So who do you think would make a good ambassador or the best ambassador there? Yep, we've got a few hands for Jim. Oh, one for Jill. It's, it's a bit of a trick question, in fact. So let's look at them more closely. Now, Jim and Jill probably have about the same number of close friends and family. Um, these are the green dots. I don't know why they're green, could be alien life forms or something, but they've got about the same, most likely, or at least on average. And then let's look at the red. So this is a slightly larger network of, of, of these people. And Jill's got slightly fewer. These, these are probably people, friends of friends, people maybe she's met once, um, maybe there's some shared interests. Um, and Jim's a bit better at connecting with them. Now, when we look into the slightly bigger network again, the extended network, the blue dots, Jim's got um, a big network, 100,000 followers. This is probably from people who like his comedy, like how funny his tweets are. Um, maybe they listen to his band. They're not, they can't be that personal um, a, a contact unless he's a massive celebrity and people feel that way. So. What are we really interested in, though, here? In a fun, if we just wanted to reach as many people as possible for a marketing campaign to get people to join our university, maybe, the more the merrier. Now, with fundraising, of course, we know that the people who typically give to our institutions, they are, you know, they might be parents, usually alumni. Um, it tends not to be the completely random stranger, often at all. So what tends to be most important in fundraising is the close networks of these people. And therefore, whether Jim or Jill's the best ambassador is less so about their network. It's more about how much they like you and how happy they are to share your messages. And our goal is to find these people. So we're starting. So we've identified a bunch of ambassadors. Maybe we've got, got Jim and Jill. Um, we found out that they're both tweeting about our university. And We've got them all. Maybe we've got 200 ambassadors ready to go. We've got some messages lined up that we're going to share before our campaign. Maybe it's our giving day. And then we remember, maybe they're not going to share. What kind of day? Maybe they're going to get nervous and not share it. So why might that be? Now, who said this? Let's see if everyone knows. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Tougher one. Now, arguably the father of, of modern business practices, it was Peter Drucker. And he was saying that about how you build a business, but it's also true in how you build a campaign and a culture of sharing and giving at your institution. So we've got our strategy ready. We've got the high influencers, but actually the most important thing is culture. I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you agree with me. You can look at those maybe uh, a really old, small, private university with great participation. I think they're really, you know, fundraising is okay for them because there's that culture of giving already, and that's why. But are there things that we can do to start to create that and create it pretty quickly to help our campaign? So going back to Babson College, so what happened here was all of the alumni share messages about their families. That's a tradition, is creating some culture in this. They're looking forward to each year is the time when they're going to connect with their friends and tell those stories. So immediately, that culture of sharing about their family is reinforcing the sharing of the fundraising asks and telling people about your gifts. So suddenly that culture is coupling with, the, with our strategy of identifying people like Boris will share for us. So that's, that's a start. Now, you might think, well, that's all right for them, but that, that we just couldn't do that. It would be really hard. And this is Bryan College, and I think, um, I think this is just about the perfect way to get people to share our messages. Wait for the person in the top right. Someone else went in. I don't know if you could hear in, in the back there, but someone said about halfway through, I love him. Now, if you want to build goodwill at your institution and create a culture, I guarantee you that every Bryant College student and probably many of the young alumni, if not many, many of the 
middle aged and older alumni too, will watch this probably many times and they will share it because they'll be desperate to share it. So that's challenge number one after this is this call is get a meeting with the president and ask them to jump in the lake. Um, maybe be delicate. But that's one way to kind of make messages share, um, make them interesting. So I want to look a little bit closer, in fact, creating that culture. Why why certain things work and if there's if there's strategies in place that we can use to make that happen. So let's look deeply at why people share. So here's your phone screen. Did you know that over 80% of us check our smartphone before we get out of bed in the morning? I'm guilty of that. I know many of you are too. Not along with me if you're guilty. Yeah. So we see that notification. I mean, which app are you going to click? You're going to click the Facebook one. You're drawn to it. Uh, we all are. Um, it, so the quality is not great on this slide, but I liked it. Facebook, I'm trying to work. Check me, check me, check me, check me. Um, it happens to all of us. So looking at um, looking at why that happens. So this is Nir Eyal. He wrote a book called Hooked when he talks about how how habits and cultures form. So I'm not sure if you can see the top left word, um, but it says trigger. The trigger on the last screen was that notification. And then we go on Facebook, we have an action, there are rewards, and we get invested in the process. And Facebook becomes a habit for us. It becomes a, it becomes a culture within our, within, within our group of friends. So let's look a bit more closely at this. So we've got the trigger in the top left. I'm actually going to start from uh, point number two here. What external trigger gets us to use the product? Okay, one, it's that our friends are using it, obviously. Two, it's that we saw a notification, so we click the screen. So we're into Facebook, we're looking around, we use it from day to day because of those triggers. And then, what do you do on Facebook that triggers reward? It might be share an image, it might be share a video, uh, maybe it's your toddler doing something cute. Um, but we do it, and then we share it. And then what happens? Well, maybe with an hour you've got 10 likes, if it's a nice photo. And you feel pretty good about yourself. My friends think something I'm doing is cool, and, and it's great. But you know what? We all want more clicks, don't we? So we go back, and we check it an hour later. And you know what? A week later, we'll post another photo. Um, maybe we post a photo of our food to show, that, show how tasty our food is. And it becomes something that we do. Um, so then we come and we become invested in the platform because we keep doing that work. So we then come around. So what's the internal trigger? Number one, what's the internal trigger that Facebook is doing for us here or social media generally? And it's actually quite deeply psychological. It's, um, it's approval. It's social acceptance. Uh, psychologists would call it part of the uh, avoidance of pain. But it works. Uh, in fact, I'm guilty of it myself. So when I moved in with my fiance um, a couple of years ago, I kept a bit of a diary. I called it hashtag living with a girl. And this one um, I enjoyed and my friends seem to enjoy is what did the toothpaste do to you? Um, are you guilty of this? First of all, don't do it anymore. Roll from the bottom. Um, and I got a lot of likes, got comments. I, I was even in the pub. My friends said that was great. Do another one. And I felt great. So I did some more. Um, now, the question is, how can we take these actions, social media, and do it for our own campaigns? Can we take this sort of habit and use these triggers to power our sharing and use social media effectively? So that's the challenge. So let's look a bit closer at that. So here's an example. So Texas Christian University, uh, and they've now run three giving days. 2014 was the first one. And they did it, and they had 20 ambassadors. Um, that we're going to help share the Giving Day campaign on the day. And then a year later, 2015, uh, they had 50. And these ambassadors were great. They're working. Then they came to, to Hubbub and they said, we want more ambassadors and we want to be able to manage them more effectively because um, we want more impact and we want to know what they're doing and we want them to do more sharing too. So we approached this problem with them. And the first stage was this. We said, first of all, we have to find them. So what we did was did some social media profiling. We found um, followers. We found out the ones who, who had 
large followings, which is great for awareness, but actually we found the ones too, as I said earlier, that was tweeting nice things or had in their profiles, I'm a grad from this university, or from TCU. So we identified people who might like to share, who would be good ambassadors. They're on Twitter, therefore they'd be good, uh, or they're on Facebook. We also uploaded a number of um, email addresses of people, uh, donors before, or other people that we thought from their database would make good ambassadors. And then we gave all those people a nice branded email inviting them to come and use, uh, to come and become ambassadors before the giving day. So they joined, they came to the branded page, they signed up. There was uh, there's some nice messaging below that I've cut here. Um, and they signed up. So they had 50 or 60 the year before. And this year they got 185 people signed up to be ambassadors um, over just a, a you know, a, a month or so leading up to the giving day. So you've got your ambassadors. Now what you want to do is you've got, you've got the influencers. That's where we've got. Now we needed to add a bit of culture. We need to get them sharing. How can we create a culture of sharing? So first of all, we give them some messages. That's the easy bit. That's the obvious bit. But we made them. These are actually editable. So what the students or the ambassadors or the alumni could do is take the message and they could personalize it. They could add a little thing so it feels like, so suddenly it's, it's their message, but they've had some guidance, so it was easy. It's one click, and they can share it through the social medium that they like to use the most. Um, it's hashtag, so it can be tracked. And in fact, down on the, the bottom right of this message, that's a unique link to that ambassador. So we can start to track their activity, how many clicks, how many donations they generate. And that's important because this comes into um, why they may, why they'll share. So we've just hit the external trigger number one. Someone has asked you to share. You like the university, you agree, they send you something on day, you share. So you've done your bit, you feel great, you walk away. Can we make it habit for them? So here's one way. We put them into a leaderboard. So we find out how much each ambassador has raised. Um, now this is mocked up because I'm not gonna share real donor names, of course, but we put them in that. We can see who's sharing the most, who's raised the most, and make them feel good. And the moment they do their first share and they get 20 clicks, but they saw someone else did 30, maybe they knew that person, that would be great. We can, they're gonna share again on this day, on the, on the weeks, le days leading up to the giving day. They really wanna win. And do you know what, if that's not enough, let's make, it, let's make them even more incentivized. Let's offer them prizes for being the best sharers, for getting the most Facebook posts, for doing the most social media clicks. Um, that's another way just to create that culture of sharing, making it fun, gamifying it. Um, and you know what? It doesn't work with everyone. I guess some people didn't know what they were signing up for, but what you can do is you can go, well, that person's not shared much. So I'm just gonna remind just that person. I'm gonna send a personal email to them. Um, I'm not sending it to everyone. So they know, oh yeah, I, I, I haven't shared this morning. I'm gonna share now. Um, so that's quite powerful too. And just in terms of managing them, how did it go? So in 2015, um, they had a little over 7,000 Facebook views on the giving day, a little over 20,000 Twitter impressions. Once finding more and making it easy for them to share and gamifying it, they had nearly 100,000 Facebook views on their giving day and d nearly doubled their Twitter impressions. And the result, uh, the goal for the day was 1,000 donors. They got 1,088, uh, which is really terrific. From their 186 ambassadors, um, and a, you know, a nice little bonus is that over 90% of those ambassadors gave themselves because they were invested. And that's because the moment you share a message, you also need to be authentic on social media. So you share a message asking people to give, and you've got to give yourself. So there's, a, there's your first 186 or 90% of that straight off the bat. So that went really well. And that's just, that's a way to add really digital or social fundraising, a social aspect to an existing campaign. You're going to do the giving day. Let's get it spread further. And it's pretty easy to do so. So no digital talk would be complete without a mention of the Ice Bucket Challenge, of course. So there's George Bush um, getting covered in ice by his wife. Um, but of course, I'm sure you've heard this. Um, it wasn't started by the ALS Association. It was started by Chris Kennedy, who, who was challenging. He decided to challenge his friends and ask that someone 
but they, if they don't do it, they give to the ice bucket, to uh, the ALS Association. Um, and do you know what? That was so clickable. It was so fun that people wanted to do it. And, and the ALS didn't even start it. So this is what this looks like. It's not centralized. It's not decentralized even. You might think that, yeah, okay, you've got these nodes, but actually it's distributed, or a better word is maybe networked, because this is where people are sharing their messages of their own accord because they want to. And in fact, the ALS Association isn't really part of it at all. I mean, yes, it benefited $115 million, but it wasn't there. And that, that's really, I come back around to what is, digital or social fundraising is taking a campaign, a cause, and it's dragging it as far to the right on this diagram as possible. It's finding ways to make it shareable, to make people make sharing it a personalized thing for them. You know, sometimes that, that you, you want to do it overnight, make it fun, add games. If you want it to go on and on and on, do something like Babson did where there's a, a family element, where there's some people are really invested in sharing once a year with their friends. Um, and that's how you do successful digital fundraising to support our campaigns. So just, I'm gonna pass over to Tom in a moment and back to Barrett, but I just, um, just wanted to share a little community here to, that if you wanna go and find out a little more about digital fundraising, um, please check out our blog, our sharing center with peer shared materials. Um, there's some free resources and crowdfundlist.org is the, the sector's digital giving um, email list. So um, I hope that's useful. I hope I've enjoyed talking to you. Uh, what I'll do is pass back to Barrett now and, and see if any questions have come in. Duncan, thank you. This has been this has been really great. And before we transition to Thomas, I, I wanted to share a couple of things and then ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first, I want to share with everyone that uh, clearly Hubbub is um, a vendor in our space. Uh, and just to be absolutely clear, uh, Duncan and I have a great relationship, but uh, there is no financial um, benefit to, to myself or to our firm for having them on. We do wanna have a show though, that allows vendors to come on and share the great work uh, that they're doing so that the institutions that we uh, represent can uh, get an idea of the different kinds of products. So with that, and before we transition to Thomas, where he's going to take us a little bit deeper into the actual Hubbub tool, um, and maybe this is a question for either one of you, I'll shoot it first to you, Duncan, and, and that has to do with, you know, this idea that uh, we're, we're finding more donors, that donor acquisition is higher. Um, we've even seen as high as maybe 40% uh, new donors are being acquired through these kinds of platforms. Um, we've also seen, though, that donor retention is a bit more of a challenge in here, primarily probably because of that same um, uh, value that you were describing, where it's friends asking friends, and the farther away from the institution you get, the less of a relationship the individual has with the institution, and they're giving more to the friends. So can you speak to that topic, uh, both the the expected donor acquisition numbers, what they ought to see, and is there anything we can do to increase retention, or is that a foregone conclusion that it's not gonna be very high? No, do you know, great questions. Um, to speak first about donor acquisition, I mean, through digital, we've seen, uh, giving days are essentially social and, uh, and digital, and, people are seeing massive increases in participation. You saw what Babson College did, basically doubling their, their participation. Over here in the UK, where, where maybe traditional giving or participation is at a lower rate, we've seen uh, participation triple within a year when people have, say, tried crowdfunding to reach more people. Um, so in terms of that, it's, it's, it's obviously having great success. Retention is a great question, and it's something that hasn't been answered well for a while, but we're now seeing some, some great examples. Um, McGill University in Canada, they added a button just before their, when you make a gift to a crowdfunding project, they ask, would you also give a, give a $5 gift direct to the university for this fund? Um, now the funds were lined up, so 
let's say it was a sport and athletics project, crowdfunding project, they then asked, would you give to the athletic fund for a portion of the uh, annual fund? And 17% of all donors, um, including non-alumni, said yes and gave a gift straight away. So in terms of getting regular donors, it's happening. Um, and recently, UC Berkeley, who, who have one probably the best crowdfunding uh, program in the country, at least by dollars raised, I think, um, have now do phonathons just to their crowdfunding donors, and uh, over 30% of them give again on the phone to other crowdfunding projects. The beauty of that approach is that they're being asked to give to a similar campaign. If you found this interesting, would you also help these students? So it's that's obviously easier. It's a high rate, it's a high retention, but it's because the ask is similar to what they gave to first. They're using what they know about the donor to make the next ask, which is which is the key, keeping it personal. Great. Let me let me ask one more here. Uh, this one has this is more of a channel question. You just referenced uh, Berkeley. And one of the ways that they're attempting to try and increase retention is utilizing the telephone channel to speak more personally and, and maybe retain more of the donors that came through a crowdfunding acquisition campaign. Um, have you seen other interesting channel mixes? Primarily, we've got email coming back to landing pages and on platforms like yours. Do you see any other channels getting put into the mix that are showing results? Um, I see things like, so Instagram is huge, not just uh, amongst my friends, but charities now are having great success with campaigns for just awareness. Things like Instagram are great for that. I, I think they're probably a bit tougher for, for making an ask. Um, so I can't give you numbers at all, but they're definitely channels worth exploring. Um, if it's the first time you're going to try a social campaign, you know, Facebook and Twitter are, are the musts. Um, so I'm sure that there's Venmo is a great example. Yeah, so that's probably one of the best ones I've seen. So that's Venmo is um, your students are probably using Venmo to pay for things on campus or to pay each other money. Um, and I know that NYU when they ran their class giving campaign, their senior class gift rather, um, a year or so ago. They said, how do we get people to give more? The students said to them, just make it easy for us. Use social giving the platform uh, Venmo that we've all got up on our phones and use that. And uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it basically skyrocketed the number of students who gave because they made it more social and easy. So, um, I'm just, yeah. There are channels, I'm afraid I don't know them all, but Venmo is definitely one to, to explore. Hey, that's great, Duncan, thank you. And thanks again for being on our show. Uh, let's transition over to